Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk from the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. Rabbi Chaim Richman here together with Yitzhak Ruvain. Today, the 17th day of the month of ER, 5776. It's May the 25th, 2016. And this Shabbat, Parshat Bichukotai, the ultimate, that is to say, the last concluding Torah portion of the book of Vayikra here in the land of Israel. That is, if you're in the diaspora, you'll be reading Parshat Behar. Temple talk this week, one day late, better late than never, technical difficulties beyond our control, but here we are. And of course, tonight, it being Wednesday already here in the land of Israel, we will beginning very shortly, Lag Baomer, the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer, and the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer has a very special place in um, Jewish hearts and minds and, um, and in our tradition because it is a day of um, joy and t intense spiritual identification because it is identified uh, with this, the great sage of the period of the Mishnah, Rabbi Shimon Ro Yochai, student of Rabbi Akiva, who was um, the great expositor of um, the Zohar, the Book of Splendor, the a great source of Jewish mysticism, it's called. It's actually in the inner dimension of how God relates to creation. Rabbi Shem Bar Yochai, author of the Zohar, the day of his passing, his yard sites, the day of his, of his death, um, and when it comes to the righteous, the day of the death is considered to be a, a very important day. Uh, that, is, that is today, tonight, beginning tonight, the 33rd day of the Omer. I just happen to have Yitzhak Ruvain here in the studio, who I happen to know is a, a serious student of the Zohar, who studies it with a group of, of, of devotees uh, privately every week. Uh, but she didn't know that about Yitzchak. He's, he's quite modest and fits in with this week's sphira, this week's divine attribute of the count of the Omer, which is hod, which is humility. In fact, the sphira of the 33rd day of the Omer, as you can watch on our Facebook page, our, our um, counting of the Omer, it's humility of humility, the humility of humility, which is like a double, double insulation of humility. That, that's Yitzchak Ruven for you, if you ask me. And here he is to tell us, I want to ask you a question, Yitzchak. What, you, what, you, what are your feelings about the Zohar? I know you've invested a lot of time, and I know it's very important to you. After that introduction, Rabbi, um, um, who am I? Uh, what can I oh, say? There's your hood showing. <laughs> it's a, my double hood. <laughs> it's like, uh, what is it? Double, double, your, double your modesty. Um, what's your question, Rabbi? No, let's talk about the Zohar. I mean, I mean, it's it's a very inspiring uh, source of um, knowledge, and uh, I like it too. But I'm not. I'm, I can, I can very, barely touch the books you it's read. It's very sprawling work, really made up of many, many books, and it's very fascinating, and it is very startling. It's very surprising, and in, in the outlook and 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 the way it presents reality and understands reality. See, Kabbalah and has a very bad rap in, in certain circles, and of course the Zohar is the classic, a really scholarly uh, um, um, source of, of the Kabbalah, and it's, m it's m much more ancient than that which was added in later centuries. And I think it's a lot different than most people think it is. I think it's a lot more um, solid, and I think it has a lot more to do with the world as we know it. And what and what it, it what it uh, proposes to do is to show an insight into. I think the most important thing about it is the um, relationship that every human being has with creation, and how every human being affects yeah. the world around us. Can That's how affect, set it up. Can influence, and under can understand what what is happening around them. Uh, in the heart of the Zohar are a couple of very, let's say, slender books, which are the Idras. And they are the direct teachings of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to his ten students. In a circle. And these books are just, they, they make the, stair, ha the hair stand up in the back of your neck, you know, they're, they're 
amazing, in what, in what fascinating, way? just um, uh, inspiring. And the, the two books is the Idra Rabba and the Idra Zut. And the Idra Rabba is, the, the Idra was the, was the chamber where they, the room where they studied. And that's called the Big Idra. And the other one is called the Little Idra. And it's referring to the same room, but one volume, I think, is as longer than the other. And the Idra Zutra is the, is the teaching that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai gave over on the last day of his life, which is Lag Omer. Wow. And it's just he beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And the most beautiful thing is that when it concludes, he's speaking, and, and, and one of the students is, is writing it down. And then the student says, he stopped speaking. And he looked, and he was lying on his side with a smile on his face. And that's how he's, his soul departed from this world, with a smile on his face. And of course, he himself had said, when I die, you know, people should celebrate that day. Because usually, you know, day of someone's death is a day of sadness that they passed. And, uh, but he introduced the idea that the day of when a tzaddik, when a righteous person dies, should be celebrated uh, um, because that person did live on this earth and did share uh, his knowledge. And of course, the knowledge uh, that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai gave over um, has just been a mainstay of, of a reality of, of Jewish existence ever since the Zohar itself became uh, known to the general Jewish public, I guess around the 15th, 16th century. Until then, it was studied in very closed groups. And uh, well, I guess you could say it was Judaism's uh, best kept secret until that time. And of course, study of the Zohar and understanding of its principles is connected with the end of days, with, with the, the, the Mashiach. So, in fact, big the tradition stuff. is that that uh, the redemption is there is a tradition that the redemption is is predicated on this knowledge going forth and becoming known, and that and that's how important it is for the mm -hmm. world to to be aware of this here in Israel and in communities abroad as well. But here in Israel, especially, there is a custom of lighting bonfires right on the thirty third day of the Omer tonight. The focal point of the celebrations of Lag Omer, of course, are in Meron, a small little village in the Galilee where the tomb of Rabbi Shimon is located. And every year, more and more people come to that happening. It's like hundreds and hundreds of thousands yeah, of people. I think over 600,000 last year. Come to Meron just to be there for that night. And, but in every neighborhood uh, in, in, in Israel, especially in a place like Jerusalem, people uh, get together, kids, and they save wood the whole year, and they light these bonfires, which some explain as some sort of memorial candle for Rabbi Shimon. Um, the interesting thing about the phenomena of Lagba Omer, of the 33rd day of the Omer, I think, is the, is the draw that it has across the board of all sorts of people, mm -hmm. secular people, people who otherwise don't really get into uh, these kind of thing, all sorts. It's, it's basically like all stripes of Jews. And I think that that is, has to do with the power of Rabbi Shimon. I think that's part of the mystique of, the, of such a renowned tzaddik who is able to unify the whole Jewish people. And that in itself is a very beautiful thing. But the bottom line of the, of the whole experience of, of the Zohar and Rabbi Shimon, I think, is the reality of um, the solidity, the reality, the, 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 the realness of, of Torah and, um, and the elevation of physicality, right? Mm -hmm. Which, of course, in many ways is the whole theme of the month of ER. Specifically this week, not only do we merit to have this week the 33rd day of the Omer, but we also had earlier this week two days, two consecutive days that were amazing. We had Pesach Sheni, which was Sunday, right, mm -hmm. the second Passover. And then the very next day, the, the 15th of ER, which was this past Monday, the 23rd of May, that was the day that the manna began to fall for the people of Israel in the desert. And... So first of all, the whole idea of, of the second Passover, again, as, we, as we've been emphasizing, as we've been talking about, it's this incredible idea, not only of 
uh, uh, God granting us a second chance, but of that second chance being dependent upon our asking for it, mm-hmm. of, of God liking the idea very, very much, but just waiting for us to come up with it. Right. And so much an embodiment of the idea of how we are to arouse God, as it were, to arouse His mercy, how we are, we are basically here to show Him that we're ready. And then the whole idea of the manna, which is so amazing, which is a basic principle and component of this month of ER, is that it was something that, uh, you know, the, the, the sages have this expression that the, the generation that received the Torah at Mount Sinai is the generation that ate the manna. And uh, besides the fact that, you know, that we, we learn all these secrets of livelihood from the manna, the fact that, you know, if you, if you tried to gather more than you really needed, that it would, it, it would rot, you know, and that, you, and, that, and that according to one's level of righteousness, that's how hard they had to work for it. You know, like those that were very righteous, it fell right outside the door. Those that were maybe a little bit less, they had to walk about a bit and, and gather. And those who were really <laughs> problematic, they had to way, go way out and get it. And all sorts of ideas about about um, how God takes care of each and every one of us according to what we need. But the, but the sages of the Midrash say a couple of very interesting things, one being the idea that the, the manna served the same function in the life of the Israelites as a prophet. And wow. the exact expression is, just like a prophet would shine a light into your crooks and crevices, into your deepest, deepest cracks, and show what you really are, mm-hmm. the manna would do the same thing. Because the man, they, I always like to say, the man is like a barium x-ray. It shows exactly your kishkas. It shows mm-hmm. what you're made of exactly. Yeah. You had to be so real. And it's gluten-free. And it's gluten-free. Yeah, unless you thought about gluten, and then it would be gluten, because it's whatever you, whatever you wanted it to taste like, because I'll say, the sages say. But the point is, what do they mean? It's like, it's like a prophet shines a light into you. you ha- a prophet speaks to you he exposes everything that you really are so to the manna why was the Torah given only to the generation that ate the manna because you had to be so you had to be such a receptacle for integrity and so real to eat that manna to, to bear it because it was like sheer will of God right so there's another interesting midrash midrashic statement that I think goes hand in hand with this idea of how the, how the manna was like a prophet shining a light into you like you had to really deal with it and it says, it says as follows. As you know, as, is, as we've taught in the past, and as is a famous idea that's expressed by the sages, the manna, all those years that the, that the Israelites ate the manna in the desert, they never had to relieve themselves because it produced no byproduct, no waste. Mm-hmm. There, was no, there was no negative uh, physical aspect of it. In other words, a person eats, and then and what, that part of the food which, nu- which nourishes, nourishes, and the other part has to be expunged. That wasn't the case with the manna. They, they didn't have to go because it was pure ratzon Hashem, pure will of God. Now, this is not just like some bathroom humor here. This isn't like some, uh, you know, cute idea or joke. This is very, very serious because here's what the Midrash states. And listen to it because it's chilling. Open your heart in the deepest way. Oh. The Midrash states that a person, a Reuven, would say to Shimon, right? A, a, a Jew would say to his fellow in the desert. He would go over to him and say, say, have you had to go lately? And the other guy would say, uh, no, I haven't. You didn't either? Wow, neither did I. And they would say to each other, whoa, this is like not normal. Chi, what is this? Do you ever hear of such a thing that you take in and you, don't, and you don't put it out? What is this? And they said, and this is the, this is the line of the Midrash. They said, we're going to explode. Wow. Eventually we're going to explode because you can't just keep putting anything out. And I believe that the, that the message of the Midrash, which is very, very deep, is, first of all, well, I mean, and, and Moshe himself, like, says in about, about this incident in the Midrash, like, or, or I think it's actually Hashem who says to Moshe, Hashem said to Moshe, like, these people, like they say in Texas, bless, this, bless their hearts. <laughs> but some, my experience is when somebody in Texas says to you, bless, bless your heart, it's, it's not really what it sounds like. It's like, anyway, so like Hashem said to Moshe, like, these people, bless their hearts, they are not satisfied, not with the good and not with the bad. I can't satisfy them, even with the good. In other words, here, the, here he is raining down on them this incredible reality of his will, right, the spiritual essence, 
and taking care of their every needs to the extent that they don't even have to worry about about relieving themselves, and they are complaining. They're complaining. So Hashem says to Moshe, like, whoa, like, I can't do anything for these people. But the deep thing about this line, about how they were saying, like, oh, I'm going to explode, is like, I'm going to explode from the Hashem inside of me. And that's this idea about the, about the sages saying in such a succinct and enigmatic way that the manna was like a prophet shining light on you, this is the will of Hashem that you are imbibing now, mm -hmm. that he, we are so connected to Him in that generation. And we're going to be talking, of course, a lot in the next few weeks about the generation of the desert, how they were so full of anomalies and contradictions and how they were so high and so spiritual and yet so flawed, which, of course, is the human condition. But the point is, they were saying, like, whoa, this isn't good. This is not a good scene. How could you do this? You didn't go either. I didn't go. I thought it was me. You didn't go, whoa. So taking it, we're going to explode, meaning I can't take the pressure of what it means that I have to be so real. I am so connected to Hashem. This, is, this, this was like a constant round-the-clock trial test of showing that we can be alive for Hashem only. That's what it was to eat the man. And no wonder, Chazal say, the expression is, Lo nitna Torah ela la'ochle haman. The generation of the, those who ate the manna, those are the ones who stood at Mount Sinai and received the Torah. Because you had to be so, what a reality check that is to eat that stuff. Reminds me of a line, Rabbi. The truth was obscure, too profound and too pure. To live it, you had to explode. <sighs> Somebody's birthday? Somebody's birthday yesterday. Yesterday? And maybe that's the technical reason that we didn't do Temple Talk yesterday. What a We're week. celebrating. What a week. That birthday was also this week. Yeah, it's my mother-in-law's birthday today. Happy birthday, mother-in-law. Happy birthday. So what I want to what I want to do now, if I may, with your permission, is I want to tie all of this into Parshat Pachukotai. Because I'd like to see you. Well, you know very well that Parshat Pachukotai, this week's Torah portion, is is uh, it's not an easy read for some people because. After the beautiful, comprehensive, sprawling blessings that are that are very economic with their words, in a very few words, it's basically like the whole gauntlet of what you would possibly need as a, as a human being in this world that Hashem promises. After that, we have these five cycles of what's called the tochacha, the admonition, which is a terrible vision of an inverted an inverted vision of reality if we don't stick the program mm -hmm. now in this week's Torah portion recorded video that I believe is available probably by the time people are listening to this or shortly afterwards God that, willing that huh God willing that it, there we explored a little bit more about the nature of these admonitions as they're called in the Torah what it really means for us today as Jews, as people, for everyone, for, hum for humanity, what it means, and, and our attitude about God. But the idea is what it all boils down to, just like the manna, just like our, our job, what, as reflected by Pesach Sheni, just like Rabbi Shimon was teaching in the Zohar, do you think Hashem is real or not? Is it real or isn't it? It's all really one theme because there there are people that that make the whole thing into just one big myth. You know, they make the whole idea of trying to 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 believe in Hashem and to be and to bring that meaning into this world and to live in a manner that reflects godliness and purpose. They make that into into a myth, and everything about this month of ER. Is is so real, and, and the manna itself, which was which is something that, on the one hand, ethereal and abstract and and hard to put your finger on. It, it's really it, it it became so real, and it is the embodiment of of this fine line that we're walking in this world with Hashem's presence. Is that there is nothing else but Hashem in the world? And that's something else that we touch upon in this week's in this week's vision of uh, Parshat Bechukotai. So I think all these things are somehow connected, and I'll see you and raise you. See you and raise you in the following manner. Big news, big news today, big news in Israel is the, is the new coalition agreement, right? New coalition agreement, new, new uh, defense minister, and 
speculation, always speculation about the future and about policy, and and we touched upon this last week in, in Temple Talk also, uh, or was it the week before? Talking about the candidates in the American presidency and everything. The bottom line, in my personal opinion, is when I read Parshat B'chukotai and I realize what the equation is, either recognizing Hashem in this world or not, like, I don't, this doesn't speak to me. The, the real, the real pol politic of the world and the machinations of people that are vying for power and the implication that it makes any difference whatsoever, it just doesn't speak to me if, if, if those people are excluding Hashem from the equation. Yep, <laughs> you're rabbi. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you read Bechu Kotai, and uh, it's very humbling. I mean, it makes Stephen King read like Mary Poppins. Um, but it is basically but just again, like just like you, you just like I'll raise you, just like you said that the man is like you're you're imbibing God's will. Bechu Kotai also is life is what you want it to be. And if you decide that life is just casual, you know that's just the way it is. There's no meaning to it, and that's exactly what you'll get. That's when what you God's say saying. Stephen King, you're you're saying that it's scary, right? You're saying right. That it's scary. What's really scary, and this is again what I was trying to teach in the in the in the video this week. I hope people watch it. What I think is more scary is the attitude. Is the attitude that <laughs> that that because why is all this happening? Because you don't even think that there's a God in the world. Right. That's that's the scariest vision of anything that could be said in Parsha Bichukotai is and, and again it's trying to emphasize that's how it happens is when you take your when you take him out of the equation, you're taking yourself out of the equation because there's only one equation, there's only one reality, and that's Hashem. And as soon as you drain your perception of, of, of life, drain God from it, then then what you've created for yourself is, is a nightmare because that's what's left. But it's all an expression of Hashem's compassion, mercy, caring, and ultimate plan that we should not forget for an instant what we're doing in this world. What we're doing right now is Temple Talk. We're about to do the second half. And that's also for Hashem. Believe me, it's not for our health. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Temple Talk. Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin with Rabbi Chaim Richmond here in the studio in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the 17th day of the month of ER 5776, 25th day of May 2016. It's the 32nd day of the counting of the Omer, and of course, tonight will be the 33rd day of Lagba Omer, which we talked about in this show's first half. I wanted to refer to that one more time, Rabbi. We mentioned that the crowds that go up to Har Moron, to Mount Moron, in the Galil, the north of Israel, each year grows. And I believe last year was over 600,000 people arrived for this one-day celebration. One day meaning day and night and the next day. Um, but to me, it just is a sign of someday, someday, when, and all it takes is someone to say you can do it, someone being the government, the police, when hundreds of thousands of Jews will ascend the Temple Mount to celebrate the beautiful holidays that are meant to be celebrated there uh, and observed there. Because so, that's where they really should be going. That's really the focal point of pilgrimage. It's, it's nice, these events around the country, because it gives a person a little taste, a little inkling of the unity of the Jewish people and the tremendous spiritual intensity that, that the people are capable of, of feeling and, and wanting and desiring. And, and it's a very beautiful thing, but 
But that's the thing. I always think about these things. Like, why, why there? Because the real heart and soul of the people of Israel is the place of the Shekhinah, the place of the Divine Presence, the, the Temple Mount. And interestingly, actually, just today on, on the Temple Institute's Facebook page, highly acclaimed Facebook page, popular Facebook page that you should be on right now if you haven't joined yet, hmm. um, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, Chief Rabbi of Safed, Spot. Right. Um, made a statement r regarding um, his vision for the future of, of the Jewish people streaming to the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. And when Jews stream to a mountain by the tens of thousands, I mean, it's a tremendous, tremendous uh, expression of, of love for Hashem. And, and the, the energy there is, is just so powerful. Um, that uh, you you know why you're there. You know what you know what it's all about. You know you know that there's purpose in life, and that's exactly what Bechukotai is, is saying to us. There's a purpose in this life, and if you understand that, and if you go toward that purpose and let that purpose guide you, then things will be good. And if you decide that it means nothing to you and there is no purpose, then you'll have a bumpy ride, a very bumpy ride. There's one thing. That, uh, that's very interesting in, in the, the blessings that you mentioned, the very uh, concise blessings mentioned at the beginning of Bechu Kotai, if we go in the way of Hashem and follow His statutes and do His commandments, that there'll be peace and security in the land. And then it says that we shall pursue, five will pursue a thousand what are the numbers? Five will pursue... Oh, it says five will pursue a hundred and a hundred will pursue ten thousand. So it's interesting. It's it didn't say that it's going to be um, uh, you know a love fest. It just said the peace. Peace means that if anything's going to be going down, we're going to be the ones on top uh, pursuing the enemy. That's what peace is. Um, you mean to say that it doesn't say anything here about equal rights or oops? Uh, it doesn't say anything about equal rights, but, but it, it doesn't, certainly doesn't say anything about two states for two people. It doesn't say two states for two people, and it doesn't even say that. That you know, from this point on to the end of time, there'll there'll be no, you know, attempts uh, to undermine us. But it says that we will, we will have the upper hand by a long shot, and that's what that means. And um, we're talking uh, earlier, Rabbi, about that very verse, very pasuk, and I believe you have a, an actual. Uh, well, first of all, I mean. The it's whole idea uh, here sure. of, of uh, again, the difference between the, the, the admonition, I'm not using the word curses on purpose, and the, and the admonition and the blessing is that the, the, ble the, the verses of the blessing is basically um, 10 verses, right? 11 verses, 12 verses. And they're very, very general. But included in these verses is everything that you could imagine of, of what life should be. And then the 46 verses or so of the um, admonition uh, are, um, well, actually, it's less than that because it, he makes his promises of return before that. But they're, they're very stark and very, very specific. And one of the things that's emphasized here is this idea of the following Hashem's commandments is equal to security and safety. And, you know, just this, just this one statement i will provide peace in the land and you will lie down with none to frighten you that is like such a beautiful thing yeah, wow. to lie down without being afraid mm -hmm. and um so you mentioned you will pursue your, you, you will pursue your enemies and they will fall before you by the sword five of you will pursue a hundred and a hundred of you will pursue ten thousand so our own rabbi israel ariel the founder of the temple institute as we all know was a paratrooper in the 1967 Six Day War. That was his first association on a very intimate level indeed with the Temple Mount, having been given the, the task uh, officially in the army in his unit under the commander Matagor, having been given the job of actually guarding over the site of the Holy of Holies, the first night of the unification of Jerusalem. Um, he said to me once in a conversation, it was very, very moving, referring to this verse, he said, I saw this fulfilled with my own eyes. 
and he talked about how the you know you see these pictures these old black and white photos right. we even have some on our on our website photographs we'll be showing of the, some again uh, Jerusalem for Yom Yerushalayim right for Jerusalem Day, these photographs of of the um, the IDF soldiers like on the Temple Mount and in the city of Jerusalem and advancing and you get a little bit of the of the heady feeling of what was like what it was like in those days and he talks about how uh, he saw like on the Temple Mount hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Jordanian prisoners um, soldiers sitting on the ground with their with their hands folded behind their heads just sitting being guarded over by like <laughs> Like two soldiers of the IDF with like their little Uzi, mm-hmm. just sitting there like to- in total submission, and it was like this ratio was right. like amazing. Uh, I f- I just was amazed by that by that uh, by that uh, memory that he had, and all these promises that Hashem makes are are indicative of his. Um, Staying and be, uh, making his presence felt with with Am Yisrael in a very very tangible way. And the reverse, the opposite of that blessing, among the admonitions, it's mentioned also that uh, if if you do not go in God's way and do not do His commandments, then you will be frightened by by a leaf that's uh, by a driven that's, leaf that's, that's right. being blown. The, the sound of a of a leaf that's rustling in the wind is going to is going to frighten you. You'll turn around and, you know, think that someone's pursuing you and you'll see that there's no one there. And I want to say about this verse, I'm no prophet or expert, but I have a, a feeling about this verse that I think is Hashem's truth. And that it, and that is that this is exactly what the reality is today. That really Hashem is with us and His presence is with us if we take it seriously, if we understand that, and there's nobody behind us at all. Yeah. And we have this tremendous neurosis, this tremendous obsession, this tremendous phobia that we are being pursued. But you know what? Honestly, if we realize who we are and what Hashem has promised us and what this land is to us, we can turn around and see that there's absolutely no one there. There's no one chasing us. It's up to us completely Reminds on, me a, of another on a metaphorical line. level. Reminds me of another line. Should I say it? Sometimes I turn, there's someone there, sometimes it's only me. Amazing. Full of lines today. Amazing. So speaking about this idea of the reality of ER, the reality of Torah, the reality of the Zohar, the reality of Pesach Sheni, the reality of the manna, and how everything is real and um, not a myth and not... Uh, abstract, but that Hashem puts us in this very, very world. Uh, again, I refer to, uh, pardon me for once again referring to this week's Torah video where we speak about the nature of reality and the fact that Hashem is the is the true reality. But I gotta say, in, in our run up towards Shavuot, that we're all feeling now the great anticipation of Shavuot coming up. And by the way, this would be a good time to mention a new feature on our Facebook page beginning today, which is. Which is each day we will feature a picture from the Temple Institute's collection. These pictures are also featured in the very recently published uh, Hebrew uh, language Holy Temple in Jerusalem, which will soon, uh, in the coming Later months, this be, be published in English. In English. And, and each picture will have uh, an explanation, a uh, uh, little teaching illustrations about, about, Shavuot. about Shavuot. About Shavuot. And of course, Shavuot is one of the three pilgrimage holidays in the Torah, uh, but it's a one-day holiday, so uh, we can't indulge in seven days of teaching about it. Uh, we, so we're going to preface it, we're going to uh, preempt it with, with teachings for the next 17 days, 18 days, leading up to Shavuot. Well, I was wanted to say about Shavuot in, in terms of this theme of reality and the, the concretization of Torah in the world is that I think one of the, the most beautiful and um, most uh, bold examples of that of that idea is Shavuot because everybody knows that the custom today uh, prevalent custom of how 
we honor Shavuot um, is to stay up all night mm -hmm. studying the Torah. It's a very beautiful testimony to the holiness of the Torah and to our appreciation of the fact that, after all, the festival of Shavuot marks the anniversary of the Sinai revelation of giving the Torah to the, to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. And we have this custom, which is not all that old, uh, not all that old, of honoring the Torah by staying up the night before those who can and studying. But the interesting thing is that, as I mentioned, that, that is not the most ancient custom. And in the time of the Holy Temple, which is the anniversary, again, Shavuot, the anniversary of the giving of the, of the Torah at Mount Sinai, this rendezvous of the divine and man, the giving of the Torah, how is Shavuot observed, celebrated in the Holy Temple? Not by, not by studying the Torah the whole night. At least it's not mentioned anywhere. It's a custom that came into being much, much later. The Torah's instructions for the festival of Shavuot is the bringing of the first fruits. Mm -hmm. Bringing of the first fruits, the season of bringing the first fruits begins with Shavuot and it extends actually throughout the, the summer. So Sukkot, even till Hanukkah really, if you're late. But the, 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 the first time to bring the first fruits to make the pilgrimage, and it's the pilgrimage itself, you know, you were speaking earlier about, we were speaking about the whole idea of the tremendous feeling of unity and camaraderie and the spiritual unity of going to these places like Meron, all, all the Jewish people converge together, and we spoke about how we would like that to be happening, how all the Jewish people will be coming to the Temple Mount. That's part of the whole idea of, of the festival in the in the time of the temple is that experience alone of the nation ascending to Jerusalem together. And that's why there are such vivid descriptions in the mission of what it was like when the people of Israel would, would, would ascend mm -hmm. to Jerusalem together and what that did for the people. But the idea is, I'm saying, you know, I might have thought that the way that Shavuot would be observed in the Holy Temple, which after all is the, is the portal for man to meet with God, right? In the Holy Temple. How come the way that it's celebrated in, in the Temple, which is, again, this is the holiday of the giving of the Torah, it is so very, very physical and earthy. I mean, you can't get more earthy than dealing with agriculture right. and the first fruits. So in other words, okay, today the, the custom is, is, is more like ethereal it's more like mm -hmm. you know it's more spiritual we study the torah cook we're not we don't we're not we're not we're not all um part of an agrarian society now and in any event we don't have the holy temple so what do you want from me we're not bringing the first fruits but the point is what is the intention of the torah why is it that shavuot is identified with bringing the first fruits it's like bringing an apple to the teacher yeah it's kind of like it's kind of like the opposite i would have i would have thought because it's so very much an expression of physicality and earthiness it's also an expression of tremendous humility, I think. But when, they, but when the, the people of Israel stood at Mount Sinai and Moshe ascended, and isn't that the time when the sages say that they were like, they became like so spiritual and everything was like a total spiritual experience and they, oh, heavens opened and they heard Hashem's voice and everything and they saw the, they saw the thunder and you're observing it by bringing, by bringing a basket of fruit mm -hmm. to the Holy Temple. But what's my point is that that is the Torah. In other words, Everything that we've been saying the first half of the program regarding the manna and all the initiative of ER and you know what the holiest thing in the world is to sanctify this world and when we bring of the first fruits of the land of Israel the seven species for which the land of Israel is praised right and we bring those things full circle and acknowledge that it comes from Hashem that everything is from Hashem that we have nothing of our own that is the translation of Torah in this world. The, the, the Torah was not given to us so that we could sit in an ivory tower and roll our eyes, pretend to be very, very spiritual. Oh, I'm a spiritual master. I don't deal with anybody all day long. I'm, I'm up in a tower and I can meditate. You know, that's not what it means to bring holiness into the world. To bring holiness into the world means to be part of this world and to exercise everything that we do to navigate through everything that life gives us and challenges us through the mitzvot. And so the elevation of earthiness, the sanctification, as it were, of earthiness, 
by bringing the first fruits, which represent our aspiration and our acknowledgement of Hashem in our life, by bringing that to the Holy Temple, that is a celebration of the giving of the Torah. That is like the perfect application of what it means to receive the Torah, because it wasn't given to us so that we would just try to be, pretend that we're not human beings. That's why the, the right. Midrash says in these very words, the Torah was not given to the angels. It was given to people, to act like people. And so that is such a beautiful and fitting way of observing Shavuot. And again, we don't have the Holy Temple now, unfortunately, yet. But you see that through the prism of life in the Temple, everything takes on its true meaning and dimension of what these things are supposed to be imparting to us and, and impacting our lives. And just as God gave to the generation in the desert for 40 years the manna, that pure spiritual will of God nourishment, that's reflected in the bringing of the first fruits to God. This is our, this is our endeavor, God. This is what we can come up with. This is, this is our work. This is our ratzon. This is our appeal to you. And as humble as that may be, and as earthy as that may be, it's pure if it comes from that place in our heart that is that is pure love of God. And you can't get you can't do better than that. You can't top that. And I don't think that God would want more than that. And uh, you know, if it comes to you know staying up all night and studying Torah or bringing that first fruit, I understand why the first fruit is the feature of of the holy temple. And uh, studying Torah all night is a very very beautiful very beautiful custom and very meaningful custom and also pure but um, I would say it's you know it's it's like the accompaniment to the to the first fruit but it certainly could never replace that first fruit. What I'm fruit. saying is that what the Holy Temple really teaches us and really amplifies is that it's real is the celebration of, of life and of that purpose. Every, everything is holy and has purpose it's like the way people look at it today. It's like Torah study is a separate thing. That's like, whoa, that's like, whoa. That's like, that's the real thing. And like, okay, if you have to make a living so you could grow something, you could do this, you could do that. The way the Torah looks at, at why, why it was given to us in the first place is because we are people and because Hashem is behind everything and in everything. And that's what we are supposed to realize. We're supposed to apply it constantly to everything. Another aspect... Um feature of Bechukotai, which is the last parasha, he said, of, of Vayikra, of Leviticus, which um, I'm a little bit uh, you know, sad to say goodbye to Leviticus. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. We love it. But of course, uh, Numbers, Bamidbar coming up, is a, it's one of the five, um, is that at this point in the history of the people of Israel in the desert, they were getting ready to go into the land. And we'll see that theme, that, that understanding follow up also in the first, in the first chapters of, of uh, Numbers, the book of Numbers, that um, this is it, really. So God is, you know, he, he lists the blessings and the admonitions in preparation for the imminent entering into the land, which was then postponed, as we know. Yitzhak, I need to mention, yeah. very briefly, that Be'ezrat Hashem, um, Mrs. Richmond and I expect to be speaking in the United States of America, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, that is, on the 21st and 22nd of June, um, and in Lubbock, Texas, God willing, on the 26th of June, I believe in Abilene, Texas, on the 28th of June, and in Houston on the 29th of June. And details about those venues and times will be available shortly through the Temple Institute's Facebook page and contact information. You heard it first here, folks. And uh, as the rabbi just said, we will soon have that information um, with contact information posted for anybody who's interested. Once again, the rabbi will be speaking, I guess it's the third or fourth week, uh, third and fourth week of, of June? Yes. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, and in Lubbock and... Abilene and Abilene Houston. And Houston, Texas. So make your plans now so you can be there with the rabbi next month. That will be a few weeks after uh, Shavuot. Um, so I guess you're going to fly solo for Temple Talk for two weeks or so. Who? I know I everyone always looks that. forward to that. Who does? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody looks forward to that. Yeah, the humblest guy on earth, right? Wasn't that you described? Hod. <laughs> 
speaking for a full 46 minutes. It's like, Ripley's believe it or not. So, Rabbi, um, happy Lagma Omer to you. Happy Lagma Omer. Again, we uh, will be saying goodbye this Shabbat to, to uh, the book of Leviticus. But, of course, in the United States and outside of Israel, uh, everybody is... Uh, one week be, behind. We'll be studying a parsha, uh, Parshat Bahar, and they'll have one more week in which to uh, bask in the, bask light, of in the light of Leviticus. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll be back next week, God willing, Temple Talk.